the strongest Demon Slayer's demon brother, Inosuke's demon father, an upper moon that's secretly a good guy, and every other demon moon in history, including interesting ones from bonus materials that 99% of you don't know about, will be discussed in this video, so make sure to stay tuned for that. If you enjoy seeing Demon Slayer content, make sure to smash that like button for more. If you haven't, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications so you don't miss future Demon Slayer videos like this one. First, let me explain how the 12 demon moons are organized. They are divided into 6 Six lower moons who have their number in one eye, and six upper moons who have their numbers in both eyes. Directly below upper moon six, you have lower moon one rather than moon seven. The weakest is lower moon six, and the strongest is upper moon one. We'll start with the weakest and move to the strongest, so the video will only get more hype as we move towards the end. So make sure to stay tuned all the way. Now I want to shout out the sponsor of today's video, AFK Arena. AFK Arena's 4th anniversary celebration starts soon and that means hype benefits for players. Participate in the anniversary event to get 100 summons. It's not my first time shouting out this awesome game, but if you didn't know, AFK Arena is a collectible RPG with a stunning 2D art style that now has 40 million users worldwide. Whether you're a veteran or have never played before, the 100 Summons Anniversary Special and the hype new crossover with the ReZero anime make this the best time for you to enjoy the excellent aesthetic experience and idle fun of AFK. You don't gotta spend all your time grinding, just check the game from time to time, your team will be getting stronger each time, and you can just focus on enjoying the various gameplay modes like PvE stories, dungeons, raid bosses, and more. I love how you can create your own squad of waifus in this game with cool and unique powers and as mentioned on the grand celebration of the 4th anniversary the crossover with ReZero is launched allowing you to add Rem and Amelia to your collection. Whether you prefer Rem or Amelia both are satisfying to watch as Amelia takes out opponents with her ice and Rem with her morning star. Rem will even join the tavern where you can meet her as a barmaid and let her walk you through the basics of this land of adventures. You can enjoy the brand new thematic dungeon with Rem and Amelia and use their awesome powers to win the battle and the treasure. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to restart your life in AFK Arena and ReZero by clicking my link in the description right now and don't forget to use promo codes AFK ReZero and Lucky2023. Come and meet Amelia and Rem for yourself in AFK. Lower Moon 6 used to be Kyogai, the drum demon. However, he slowly lost the ability to eat humans. Muzan was disappointed that he had already reached his limit and took away his Lower Moon 6 title. So he failed as a demon moon. He tried his hand at writing, but he was told it's boring. He was told that everything he wrote was trash and that he should stop writing. He did not respond well to the criticism and killed the harsh critic using his demon powers. So he failed at writing too. His whole life he was told by people he wasn't good enough. Only Tanjiro as he kills him praises him. He says that his blood demon art is very impressive. And that actually makes Hyogai happy. He asks Tanjiro if it is really strong and Tanjiro says it's very strong. Kyogai is touched that Tanjiro saw value in him when everyone else had always told him that he was worthless. He's touched that Tanjiro recognized that his manuscripts don't deserve to be stepped on. Kyogai was so overwhelmed that he began to cry as he disappeared. He was a demon and he killed people he had to be stopped. However, his dying scene shows us that Kyogai's life might have been very different if only he was surrounded by people who recognized his value earlier on rather than people who constantly put him down and made him feel worthless. It took more than demon blood to turn him into a monster. Now let's talk about his impressive powers. He can manipulate his drum house by using the drums all over his body. Not only can he make the house rotate left, right, forwards, and backwards, he can use the drum on his chest to create a claw attack and the drum on his back to teleport himself into another room. He can increase the speed of his drumming to increase the speed of rotation and the number of slashes that appear when he uses his claw attack. I have to admit, along with Tundra, I was impressed by the drum powers when I saw them in action. The newer Lower Moon 6 was named Kamanue. After Lower Moon 5 Rui was killed, Muzan called the Lower Demons together, including Kamanue. He is furious that the Lower Demons are so weak. Kamanue is the first Lower Moon Muzan kills, not because he talked back, but because he thought back. Muzan can usually read all of people's thoughts if he gave them blood, and if they are in visible range. So he kills Kamanue before he turns his attention to the other lower moons. Unfortunately, Kamanue dies before we get to see his unique powers. Lower Moon 5 was Rui, the cool looking Spider-Man demon. His backstory is tragic like that of most demons. Rui was born with a weak body. He never ran and it was even difficult for him to walk. Muzan helped him get a strong body by turning him into a demon. The only problem was, now he had to eat 
people and he had to avoid the sun at all costs. His parents wanted him to have a strong body, but they were devastated by the fact that he began killing humans. Once upon a time, Rui was touched by a story he heard where parents died in order to save their child, who was drowning in a river. He was moved by the parental love and the bond that caused them to sacrifice their own lives for another. He always wanted that bond, but his parents tried to kill him instead. So Rui killed them and began searching for real bonds. He created a fake spider family and tried to force family bonds using fear. Obviously that didn't work, but he eventually realizes that the bond he had with his parents was genuine. They weren't bad people, they were going to take the life of demon Rui and then their own lives. The fact that Rui killed innocent people and would continue to kill innocent people couldn't be overlooked, but his parents were ready to atone with him by sacrificing their own lives. Even as she was dying, Rui's mother apologized because she couldn't give him a healthy body. There was a genuine bond there, but Rui thought he had severed it by killing them. However, as he's dying, he sees his parents again. They welcome him back with open arms and forgive all of his actions. They're going to follow Rui wherever he goes, even if it's the underworld, despite the fact that they committed no sins themselves. This is one of the most touching moments in the series and it illustrates the fact that Rui had the strongest of family bonds to begin with. Rui apologizes, he takes full responsibility for everything and cries in the arms of his loving parents as the flames of hell approach the United Family. I give 10 billion points to the mangaka for being able to make me sympathize with a character who seemed so cold and brutal in the beginning and even hurt our precious Nezuko. Onto the spider powers, Rui easily outclasses Kyogai and that's reflected in the fact that Tanjiro and Nezuko unlock new OP abilities and it's still not enough to defeat Rui. This demon fights with spider webs that are insanely strong and sharp. When he goes full power, the threads turn red and are even more powerful. Despite how epic the Dance of the Fire God was, and oh man was it epic, Rui was intelligent enough to use his strengths to rip off his own head, so that he can simply attach it later. However, he was no match for Gyu, who not only rendered the OP red strings meaningless with his dead calm ability, but went on to cut off the demon's head in the blink of an eye, before he could even remove it himself. To put the cherry on top of the cake, Gyu had a completely stoic emotionless face when he cut this OP demon's head off when all the screaming and emotions in the world couldn't help Tanjiro defeat that same demon. I must say, the way Rui's death is written, from his fight with Tanjiro to his family reunion in the afterlife is masterfully done. Lower Moon 4 was called Mukago. She was a two-horned demon and she was the most cowardly out of all of the demon moons. Muzan read her mind and figured out that Mukago always intended to flee if she ever encountered a Hashira. Obviously Muzan is going to punish such cowardice. He quickly kills the sweating and crying Mukago. And as with Kamanue, we never get to figure out what Mukago's specific powers were. Lower Moon 3 was called Wakuraba. He had X-shaped scars on his forehead and cheeks. He tries to run away from Muzan before he can kill him, but Muzan Muzan quickly beheads him. As with some of the other lower moons, we never get to see Wakuraba's powers. Lower moon 2 was called Rokuro. He begged Muzan not to kill him. He said he would definitely be useful to Muzan. He tells the demon king of pop to give him more of his blood and he'll become stronger. But the fact that a lower moon would dare give him instructions only infuriates Muzan. And that was the end of the line for Rokuro. His powers were also not revealed, but don't worry, we get to see all of the stronger demons use their OP powers and they get very crazy indeed. Now, before moving on to Lower Moon 1, we need to discuss Hairo, a former Lower Moon 2. He debuted in Kyojo Rengoku's side story. At this point, Kyojuro wasn't a Hashira yet, and defeating Hairo was actually what finally allowed him to be promoted to the position of Flame Hashira. Kyojuro's father, Shinjuro, faced Hairo before and humiliated him, so the demon swore revenge. He spent years growing stronger until he became one of the demon moons. He actually thinks Kyojuro is Shinjuro when he sees him. His human backstory is that he he was a swordsman and a follower of Bushido, but one day dudes with guns took him down and taunted him by saying, and I quote, try stopping our bullets with Bushido, end quote. He came to think of Bushido as a relic of the past and that's why he primarily uses guns as a demon. Lower Moon 2 Hairo has the unique and bizarre trait of shooting himself in the head to help him keep calm. He also uses other weapons like rifles, machine guns, and timed bombs in battle. His blood demon art lets him create and manipulate shadows in unique ways. He can store stuff like weapons in the shadows and then pull them out when desired. We also see him use shadow wolves to attack Mitsuri, and they are able to absorb weapons used against them. His final move, blood demon art capture cavity werewolf of horror, props for how long that name is, lets him become a giant shadow wolf. 
In this form, he wields a sword against Rengoku, but Kyojuro comes out victorious. Hairo can't help but say that he admires Rengoku's swordsmanship before he disappears. Look at that, even demon enemies love Rengoku. Lower Moon 1 was the sadistic Enmu. Enmu perhaps unintentionally used reverse psychology on Muzan and it worked wonderfully. While the others were begging for their lives, Enmu was excited by the prospect of Muzan personally killing him. Rather than fearing death, the sadistic demon was grateful that Muzan saved him for last, and allowed him to listen to the screams of the other lower moons. Muzan was won over by Enmu's unorthodox behavior, and instead of killing him, Muzan gave him an abundance of his blood to make him stronger. His special powers allow him to enter someone's dreams, and he can destroy their minds by destroying their spiritual core within the dream. However, going into someone's dream can be dangerous, so he sent others in his stead to locate and destroy his enemy's spiritual core. Additionally, his blood, which he mixes into the train tickets, puts people to sleep if they touch it. If all that wasn't enough, he can also assimilate his body with large inanimate objects like a train. In this way, he can potentially eat and assimilate all the hundreds of train passengers. He can detach body parts like hands or his head, and they can continue to move and even talk as well. His talking hands can even hypnotize people into falling asleep. This guy is just full of handy tricks. However, Tanjiro's Dance of the Fire God cuts through his train spine and effectively puts an end to Enmu's dreams. Now, before moving on to the hype upper moons, I need to mention one more former lower moon one, Ubume. When she was human, she was called Yae. Before she was turned into a demon by Muzan himself, she was a wife and mother who cared deeply for her loved ones. However, after becoming a demon, she became twisted, cruel, and merciless. She is the primary antagonist of the third Demon Slayer light novel, Ubume is the demon moon that Sanami beat in order to become a Hashira. However, Sanami lost his friend, Masachika Kumeno, in that battle, showing how strong Ubume was. Her demon art was being able to cast powerful illusions that could even trick the Kinoe ranked Sanami at the time. And now, no offense to the lower moon, but it's time to jump into the more powerful and more hype Upper Moons. The title of Upper Moon 6 used to belong to Daki and her brother Gyutaro. So let's start with their tragic backstory. Daki's real name was Ume, which was the name of the disease that killed her mother. Daki and Gyutaro were born poor and they started out at the bottom of the food chain in the red light district. They were a burden because it cost a lot of money to feed the siblings and keep them alive. Gyutaro was born first and his mother tried to kill him many times because he was such a nuisance to her. He had a weak body, but he desperately tried to stay alive, and he did. Everyone laughed at him because of his ugly voice and appearance. But if the words couldn't hurt him, the rocks they threw at him definitely could. He was ugly, dirty, covered in dirt and dandruff, and smelled bad because of all the fleas. In a place that values beauty above all else, he was viewed like a monster, and he had to resort to eating rats and bugs when he was hungry. Forget Drake, that's the actual bottom and Gyutaro is the one who started from it. However, when Ume was born, something changed. She was his pride and joy. In contrast to him, she was exceptionally pretty. He realized that he was great at fighting and trained so that he could use a sickle effectively. He became a collector. People feared him and were disgusted because of his ugly appearance, but he began to take pride in his ugliness. Now it felt great. His beautiful sister blew away his sense of inferiority. He wanted both of them to work together and create better lives for themselves. Themselves. But this dream was complicated when Ume turned 13 and poked out a samurai's eye with her hairpin. She was tied up and burned alive while Gyutaro was away. When he came back, his little sister was burned to a crisp. Gyutaro screamed at the injustice as tears flooded down his eyes. Then while he was mourning, he was attacked from behind by the samurai. He killed the samurai who, as Gyutaro points out, lived in a house that sheltered him from the wind and rain. The samurai was spoiled, by comparison. He had a nice kimono, nice skin, full meals, and a beautiful futon probably. And this spoiled guy took the one thing Yutaro had going for him, his sister, and then tried to take his life too. He struggled his whole life and worked ceaselessly so he could create a better life for his sister, and then in an instant, someone who was born with everything burned her alive like it was nothing. Not only did the samurai have no remorse, he tried to kill Yutaro too. After Gyutaro Gyutaro killed the samurai, he took his sister and searched for help, but as usual, no one would come and help them. He finally collapsed on the snowy ground. Then Upper Moon 2 came and he gave them both his blood, including the all but dead Ume. Gyutaro never regretted his decision to become a demon because it meant saving his little sister. He also couldn't forgive others for having better lives and decided that he'll snatch them away and collect them. In the end, Gyutaro feels bad, not for himself, but for Ume. 
He believes that she would have had a better life if he hadn't raised her. He feels like he corrupted her. In Purgatory, he tells his sister not to follow him because he wants her to be free from his corruptive influence. However, Ume just apologizes for everything and runs to hug him. She says she won't let go and that they'll be together forever. Yutaro is touched. Then together they move forward as the flames surround them. This is another one of the most touching moments in the manga. You can feel for these two despite all the horrible things they have done. It's bittersweet. It's sad that they were born into such a cruel and unfair world, but it's kind of beautiful that in the middle of all that pain and suffering, they had each other. Now let's talk about their powers. Daki's blood demon art is Obi Sash manipulation. These Obi Sashes are made from her flesh. They are strong enough to block Nichiren blades and are sharp enough to cut down her opponents. She can use these sashes like an octopus uses tentacles. She's like a stronger and prettier Doc Ock. She can turn her own body parts into these sashes as well. For instance, if someone tries to cut off her neck, she can turn it into this fabric and it will bend with the sword, making it harder to cut. She can also store living people inside her sashes, which she does to keep her food fresh. She can even detach part of herself and that sash can act on its own and watch over things like her stores of living human victims. Then there's Yutaro's powers. Yutaro already had skills using a sickle, and his demon powers allow him to capitalize on those skills. He can use his flesh and blood to create sickles that are coated with fatal poison. He can send countless blood blades flying at his opponents. He can also take control of his sister's body and create perfectly coordinated tag team attacks. Another added benefit is that both his head and his sister's head have to be cut off at the same time or they will simply regenerate. In the end, Daki and Yutaro were defeated, but it took a Hashira, a number of talented demon slayers, a protagonist's OP demon sister, some wives, and probably some good old fashioned luck to just barely win. This was one of my favorite arcs, if not my favorite in the series, and a large part of the reason is because Daki and Yutaro made for such amazing and powerful antagonists. The title of Upper Moon 6 went on to get inherited by Kaigaku, who was previously a demon slayer and Zenitsu senpai. Kaigaku and Zenitsu studied under under the same thunder style sensei. Because his one student became a demon, Zenitsu sensei committed seppuku and no one was even there to cut off his head, so he suffered a long and agonizing death. Kagaku is glad that his sensei died painfully because he worked so hard and he was never given the thunder style successor title. The sensei wanted Kagaku, who could use every thunder style breath except the first, to share the successorship with Zenitsu, who could only use the first one. However, this wasn't enough for the greedy Kagaku. The demon blood made Kagaku's thunder style even stronger, but he still lost to Zenitsu, who created his own seventh form called Flaming Thunder God. Yushiro later points out that Kagaku still had no idea how to use his new found demon techniques and abilities so Zenitsu was lucky because he would have lost if Kaigaku had more time to get used to his demon powers. His demon reinforced thunder style allows Kaigaku to actually summon his own lightning which burns flesh and allows him to strike from a distance. The lightning also acts like a kind of poison continuing to attack the flesh. Yushiro has to apply a special agent that stops the advance of a blood demon art so that the slashes on Zenitsu's face won't spread all the way to his eyes. Upper Moon 5 was Gyoko, the genie with two mouths where his eyes should be and an eye where his mouth should be. He creates gruesome works of art out of the bodies of his human victims. Muichiro, the mist Hashira, is the one who faces off against him. Muichiro awakens a demon slayer mark on his face and with his increased powers manages to defeat Gyoko by cutting off his head with a quick slash. One of those quick slashes that takes a second to show the damage. Now let's talk about Upper Moon 5's power. He has multiple pots and he can teleport between them until the pots are destroyed. He has another form he can enter when he needs more power. In this form, he is covered in scales that are harder than diamond, and everything his fist touches turns into sweet little fish, to use his own words. He calls himself an existence that knows no bounds in this form, which is why it's even funnier when a 14-year-old ends his old career. Lastly, he can summon octopus tentacles from his jar. He can trap enemies in suspended water, and he can release fish-like demons that feed on enemy flesh, and even even if the opponent cuts them, they'll release a poisonous liquid that can be absorbed through the skin. Upper Moon 4 was Hantengu. We get a glimpse of his past as a human. He was a mentally unstable person who stole and killed people, and then blamed it on his uncontrollable hands. Thus, he always felt like a victim and he viewed people who were trying to bring him to justice as bullies. Tanjiro is the one who manages to finish him off. This demon has impressive stealth skills, he can sneak into the blacksmith village, and he can even sneak up on both Muichiro and Tanjiro, two skilled and experienced demon slayers, especially Muichiro. His small body also makes him hard to spot and hit. He can divide his emotions and they'll manifest in different forms 
that will fight for him. He makes an anger clone that fights with lightning, a joy clone that fights with wind, a sorrow clone that fights with a spear, a pleasure clone that fights with sound, a fear clone with high defensive abilities that contains Santangu's core, and a large resentment clone, a last line of defense that hides the original demon in its heart. The anger clone can also absorb other emotion clones to create the more powerful hatred clone that appears to be able to use all the powers in one, since it could use the pleasure clone's sonic scream. It can also summon powerful wooden dragon heads, and as we know, multiple dragon heads are always powerful AF, just look at Bloy's ultimate dragon and five-headed dragon from Yu-Gi-Oh. The title of Upper Moon 4 got passed down to Nakime, the emotionless Cyclops musician. As Mitsuri points out, Nakime can move her interdimensional fortress as if it were her own hands and feet. We're told her powers aren't very deadly, but they make her very difficult to defeat. She's like an advanced version of former Lower Moon 6 demon Kyogai. While Kyogai controls his house, Nakime controls what seems to be an infinite interdimensional fortress. She can bring anyone she desires into the fortress and she is able to create teleporting doors wherever she wants. This way she can teleport her opponent somewhere else if they try to attack her. She can also create several detached eyeballs from her body and use them to spy on people from long range. This ability allowed her to locate many demon slayers across Japan. It even allowed her to locate the well-hidden mansion of Kagaya Ubuyashiki, which was supposed to be one of the best kept secrets in the entire series. Upper Moon 3 was Akaza, who actually had one of my favorite backstories and character arcs in the series. I definitely didn't think I'd feel this way after he killed the flame Hashira Kyojo Rengoku, but the mangaka pulled off some top tier writing witchcraft and made me sympathize with Akaza, even though I didn't want to. Keep in mind, he was 18 when he became a demon, so he was still practically a kid. But let's take a look at his life up to becoming a demon. He was born with fangs, so he was called a demon child all his life. When he was growing up, Akaza had a sick father, who needed expensive medicine. So, from a young age, Akaza was forced to steal so he could afford the medicine. The tattoos on his demon body seemed to be inspired by actual tattoos he was given as a kid for pickpocketing. He was visibly marked as a criminal for all to see at a very young age. He felt like he had to become stronger so he could run away with more wallets, beat up people who came for revenge, and escape the magistrate. After receiving three pickpocketing tattoos, he was told that his wrists would be cut off next time. But an 11-year-old Akaza, after receiving 100 blows, told them to go ahead and cut his wrists off, since he'd still have his feet to use for pickpocketing. Then one day, he got some really heartbreaking news. His father had hung himself because he wanted Akaza to live an honest life and he didn't want to live off money that was stolen from others. In a letter, he apologized for being a nuisance to his son. However, Akaza never viewed his father as a nuisance. His father never did anything wrong. In fact, his father was his reason for living. He would have gladly endured the harshest punishments for his dad even if they lacked lasted a hundred years. After his father took his own life, Akaza hugged his grave and cursed the unjust world. He got into brawls with people and in one instance, he beat up seven adults with his bare fists. That's when Keizo, the bare-fisted martial arts master, entered his life and whooped his butt for his own good. He took Akaza into his home despite the fact that he was banished from Edo for being a criminal. Not only that, he trusted him to take care of his sick daughter while he was at work. His wife used to do it, but she drowned herself from the fatigue of nursing her. She feared that her daughter would only get worse and worse until she died, and she couldn't just wait for that to happen anymore. Akasa started caring for Koyuki, his sensei's daughter, and he fell in love with her. He had hit rock bottom when his dad died, but he finally found a new reason to live, and things eventually got better than they'd ever been. Akasa was such a good guy that he hated when people apologized for being sick. He knew that they would help themselves if they could, and more importantly, he wanted to help them. He never saw helping others as a bother. Rather, he saw it as the least he could do, and what's more, it gave his life purpose. At one point, Koyuki feels bad that Akaza is missing out because of her and asks him to go watch fireworks. However, he prefers to stay by her side and tells her that they'll go next year or the year after that. He wants to go see them with her when she's feeling better. Koyuki was so touched by that that she cried. Akaza found out that his sensei got the dojo when he saved the previous owner. However, a rival dojo was jealous and made sure he had no students. Akaza was saved by his sensei and his daughter. Training in the dojo and nursing Koyuki healed his heart. He was there for over three years and Koyuki was starting to live normally. Akaza sensei offered Akaza his dojo and his daughter's hand in marriage. Because he had the tattoos of a criminal, he never imagined having a future at all, let alone a future where he was loved by someone. And yet, here he was being told that it was going to happen. He would get more than he could ever have hoped for. But just when he got everything he could have ever wished for, it all got snatched away. When he was away, his sensei and his fiancée were poisoned. 
They were poisoned because the aforementioned jealous martial artists couldn't beat Sensei Keizo or Akaza in a fair fight so they resorted to poisoning their well. There's also the fact that the heir of the dojo next door was in love with Koyuki so he was infuriated that Akaza, then called Hakuji, was going to marry her. Once again Akaza couldn't save those who were most precious to him. He had promised to protect his fiance for his entire life and he felt like he broke that promise. Akaza went on to attack the rival dojo that was responsible for the poisoning. He killed 67 swordsmen with his bare hands. As time passed no one could believe that such a thing actually happened and the recorded events of that night were regarded as a fictitious tale for 30 years before being erased. Muzan showed up when Akaza no longer wanted to live. Akaza was turned into a demon and lost his memories. He kept wanting strength even though he no longer had a thing to protect. And yet, as a demon, he never killed women. And eventually, he regains his emotions and, as Koyuki puts it, returns to his original self. Although as a demon he could have kept fighting Tanjiro, he decided to stop and go to the afterlife gracefully. Tragically, he couldn't join the ones he loved in heaven because of his actions, but he died happy because they never stopped loving him. Now after hearing that, try and tell me that this isn't a beautifully written character. You can't do it. Now let's turn to his powers. He is insanely strong. He beat Rengoku and would have probably defeated Dance of the Fire God Tanjiro and Awakened Mark Giyu if he didn't choose to die a graceful death instead. So we're talking insane power. In his demon form, Akaza's already impressive strength and fighting skills dramatically increase, not to mention his regenerative power. His blood demon technique allows him to create shockwave-like attacks. It also allows him to detect bloodlust or fighting spirit in his enemies. His final technique is called Blue Silver Chaotic Afterglow. He launches countless shockwaves at an incredible speed. Even though Giyu tried to neutralize it with dead calm, he failed and was hit with a hundred blows almost all at once. And here's a bonus fact for the hardcore fans. Notice how snowflake patterns appear below Akaza as he uses his technique. Well it's not random. Koyuki's name contains the meaning for snow and she used to wear snowflake hair decorations. How romantic is that? Even after losing his memories and becoming a demon, his love for Koyuki still manifested itself. Upper Moon 2 was Doma, the eccentric cult leader demon. He was born with rainbow colored eyes and was groomed to be the religious leader of the Eternal Paradise cult. His father kept making love to his female cult followers and as a result Doma's mother stabbed him to death. She went crazy and took her own life with poison. Doma wasn't concerned about his parents being dead though, he was concerned about the mess his mother made in the room. Not for a moment did he feel sad or lonely. Human emotions were nothing to him even before he turned into a demon. And it was at age 20 that Muzan finally turned him into one. Doma was pretty pretty busy as a demon cult leader. He wasn't sleeping with its cult followers as far as we know, but he was eating them. At some point, he turned Gyutaro and Daki into demons. He also crossed paths with Inosuke. Inosuke's mother escaped to the Eternal Paradise cult to get her and her baby son away from an abusive household. So you could say that Doma became a kind of demon stepfather to him at this point. Doma actually intended to let Inosuke's mother live out her lifespan. He wasn't going to eat her. She was beautiful and had a great singing voice. However, she found out that Doma was eating other followers. She fled and dropped baby Inosuke off a cliff before Doma caught up and killed her. He assumed the baby was as good as dead. But as we know, Inosuke is a tough dude and managed to survive Jungle Book style. Then there was the time he killed Kane Kocho, the flower Hashira. This marked the end of him in a way. Kane's younger sister Shinobu Kocho, the insect Hashira, set out to get revenge. And she does, in the most epic fashion. She fills her body with custom poison over a long period of time and allows Doma to eat her. This poison weakens him enough so that the adoptive younger sister of Kanae and Shinobu can finish him off, with some help from Inosuke. This is one of the best revenge arcs I've seen in anime and it makes this fight one of my favorites. Doma's demon powers allow him to create ice and frost by using his own flesh and blood. He uses two fans to help channel his ice powers. He can create ice clones of himself to fight for him. For his strongest attack, he can create a giant bodhisattva statue out of ice. That statue can attack enemies and it produces deadly cold air that can freeze opponents. However, he waited too long to use this attack and since he was so weakened by the poison, Doma and his overpowered giant ice statue were defeated. The strongest and final upper moon, upper moon one was Kokushibo, the six-eyed samurai. The strongest demon moon used to be a demon slayer named Michikatsu Tsu 
Tsugikuni. He was also the brother of Yorichi Tsugikuni, the strongest demon slayer in history, who beat Muzan in the past and gave him PTSD. Before becoming a demon, he had a child that would keep his bloodline going for centuries. In fact, the Hashira Mui Chirotokito is a descendant of his. Michikatsu received the demon slayer mark that drastically increases one's power at some point, but as he explains, the marked ones die before they reach the age of 25. Those who show the mark after 25 will quickly die. Turning into a demon was a way for Kokushibo to avoid death while increasing his power even more. He was also always jealous of his brother Yorichi and wanted to become the strongest. He thought that becoming a demon would help him to do it, but he sacrificed everything for nothing since an old Yorichi was still significantly stronger. Aside from that time old man Yorichi almost ended him, Kokushibo went on to serve as the unbeatable number one demon moon for centuries. Upper Moon 1 Kokushibo uses demon enhanced moon breathing. Since we know that Yorichi's sun breathing is the strongest breath style, it makes sense that his brother's moon breathing would be the second strongest right off the bat. However, as with Kaigaku, it becomes even deadlier when you add blood demon arts to it. Every slash Kokushibo makes with his sword is surrounded by many crescent moon like blades that change in size and length. This adds power, range, and unpredictability to his already dangerous attacks. His sword is made out of his own flesh and has multiple eyes on it which increases his range of vision. Because it's made of his own flesh, it can regenerate when broken or even change form and become longer. We see they can summon these blades all over his body and launch crescent blades in all directions when he wishes to and these blades easily cut through enemy flesh. Kokushibo even regenerates his head after it's cut off, like Muzan can do. However, after he sees the monster he's become reflected in Sanami sword, he begins to disintegrate again. I'm not taking away from all of the damage that the Demon Slayers inflicted upon him, but I think Kokushibo's past finally caught up with him too. And that was a contributing factor to him not evolving into a demon, like Muzan that's immune to beheading. He wanted to be the strongest samurai, but then he realized he was the furthest thing from an honorable samurai. He even contemplated the ugliness of not admitting defeat even though they took off his head. He started to realize that this is not what he wanted. And as we saw with Akaza, the human psyche prevented demon demon regeneration. But that was just the tip of the iceberg, and if you want to see how deep the Demon Slayer iceberg actually goes and discover all the darkest secrets that dwell deep below the surface, then you don't want to miss my Demon Slayer iceberg video, link on screen right now and in the description. See you there!